Welcome to Managing Sexuality Intelligently. My name is Jason and I'm here with Stephen Ng, Marriage and Family Therapist. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I'm glad to be here. Today is part two of the intentional interview. In part one, we explored Steve's personal history of dating and relationships and discussed how his experiences both in life and in work allowed him to develop the concept of the intentional interview. In part two, we will explain what the intentional interview looks like, how to put it into practice, what are the guiding principles, and so on. So Steve, last week we discussed your dating life. We also discussed your first marriage and divorce and how you eventually met your next wife, who you spent hours talking on the phone to prior to ever meeting in person. During this time, you also became a therapist who works with violent and sexual offenders, and through this process started learning a lot about human behavior. It seems like all of your life experiences and education up to this point caused a shift in how you started thinking about dating and relationships. You became a lot more intentional and clear with what it was you were looking for in a partner. My question is, when did you first put a name to this idea of the intentional interview? When did you say, this is the intentional interview and this is how it's done? Oh, gosh, you know, there was no specific date that I, I circled in my diary that day. Um, <laughs> you know, and I, I think it's been year, it's been so many years since I developed that idea. And I developed that in, 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 um, in an effort to help my clients who were struggling with intimacy skill deficits and who had no idea where to begin because for them as for indeed most of us i think is that uh at least most guys start off with hey she's really cute and she's willing to go out with me i think we're good to go and so that's sort of the end of the interview right there and if it, mm -hmm. if the affection or the interest is mutual it kind of blossoms from there i i've experienced so much pushback on this idea of doing this intentionally. And it's a little surprising to me because, um, from your clients or from who specifically? About oh, them? readers, uh, mm -hmm. psychology today, um, clients for sure. Sometimes, uh, although not nearly as, as often, um, including, uh, uh, people in my personal life who found out about this and wondered, and I think the fear is that it seems mechanistic or somehow mechanical in the sense of not being uh, natural, spontaneous, uh, typical of a love affair. And, well, it's not really typical of most love affairs like we would see in a movie. Instead, it is intentional. But really, although the term may be off-putting, and I'm certainly willing to throw it away if someone comes up with a better term, the idea is just really leaning into getting to know someone and at the same time letting them get to know me and the, the the pleasure in that when i bring up what a pleasure that is all of my clients nod their heads and acknowledge yes that is a real pleasure so it it's it's meant to be a really positive thing and what it's not meant to be is an interrogation you know under the harsh light of a a cynical sort of uh, analysis, like I, my reptilian brain is ready to eat them as well as possibly date them. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's, it's, I think so many people have been afraid of this because it's a new idea. So they, they come up with words to try to attach to their fears, but really it's a very pleasurable and pleasant activity. Well, the thing about it is the, if you do it the organic way, the organic way is what you describe as you meet a person you find attractive and then you go from there. That right. seems to be organic and yeah. organic relationships don't seem, at least to me in my experience, to really end up that great. Well, I mean, you know, that uh, word organic, I'm kind of an old hippie. So that word organic is still dear enough to me that I want to claim it for my own. But, you know, I think Organic to me would be the nature of a comfortable, uh, enjoyable conversation unfolding mm -hmm. as opposed to what invariably happens with so many people is avoidance, avoidance, avoidance. Mm -hmm. There was a great article, I think it was in the New York Times by Anna Sussman on just what it is so many women uh, are missing when they date men. And it was this very idea of uh, men being open to really talking, talking about their feelings, talking about what's important to them, talking about the reasons um, that they're even on this date. I mean, that there's a longing 
uh, in the hearts of many millions of us to get to know the other mm-hmm. before we go forward. And it's frustrating when some people really just don't seem to want to be known or they just, they simply don't know how to do it. Well, do you think that most people know themselves? Or? No, you know, and I, I think there's, there's a, an, old existentialist quote, you know, to know myself, I must first know the other. Mm -hmm. And I think in our conversations with friends and family, and in this case, romances or budding romances, we have a chance to really get to know ourselves better by asking, you know, what they think about certain issues or how in the past they've handled things. How is it even possible that such an incredibly good looking woman as she could be single at this time? And you get this wonderful unfolding of her history as she sees it, as she understands it. Mm -hmm. And that is very illuminating. It tells me so much, not only about her history, but also how she views the world and what's important to her. And it provides, yes, an organic uh, opportunity for me to reciprocate by sharing um, from my own life. Mm-hmm. You know, even if she doesn't say, and what about you? How is it such an ugly old coot as yourself is <laughs> still single? <laughs> and I, I think for for all of us, it's it's such a joy to have someone who's really honestly interested in getting to know us mm-hmm. and to really have the pleasure of getting to know them. It's a, I know for some narcissists out there, that's a pleasure that will never be experienced. But for most of us, getting to know another person in this way, even if even if we find that we're really not right for each other, it's still very pleasurable. It's still an enjoyable date. And I would even say a very successful date. Well, you have to get past the idea of um, a lot of your own opinions or what you're looking for. Like if, if you say to me, like if we're on a date and you're like, well, I, I, I don't do the dishes until the next day or something uh-huh. and that's something that like really bugs me right some people be like well that's it it's over i'm just gonna shut down now but you're with the intentional interview and you start applying it it seems like you continue on in the conversation and you take that as information that you receive and that doesn't mean that you have to date the person but you can still have an enjoyable date beyond anything like that that comes up right you know for me i'm about as far as the east is from the west when it comes to Nazis and sympathizing mm-hmm. with Nazi thought. But if I was dating a woman and, and I discovered, oh, she had a swastika tattooed, you know, on a, just above her um, shoulders hem, mm-hmm. um, that's most likely going to lead to us not being <laughs> a long term relationship. But I still think it would be fascinating to ask that question. So Tell me, how did you develop an interest in mm-hmm. the democratic socialism? Yeah. And I, I would want to know um, where that all comes from. And I'd like, I mean, there's got to be an interesting story there. Mm-hmm. So no matter what it is, it's a little bit like being an interviewer for a newspaper or a, any other news outlet and really getting to know a subject. And the reason we watch those sorts of interviews or read those sorts of biographies is because it is so interesting. So yeah, even finding out that the other person is not right for me, that's, that doesn't really take away from the pleasure of it. And you also mentioned sometimes the benefit of just staying in the conversation and staying in it is that you could use it as practice and that it's always. Yeah, I laugh because I always think about crash test dummies, (laughs) you know, bayonet dummies in the military. And, you know, the truth is all of us have a, a, a set of social skills. And in each one of those sets, there's a lot of room for improvement. I know mine have improved over the years and they continue to improve. And so even if I've already decided, yeah, I just don't think this is the one for me, hanging in there and enjoying the conversation and enjoying the give and take of that conversation, I think is really good practice. Also, you know, it's a little suspicious to me when my brain is thinking, okay, that's it. I'm I'm, I'm drawing a line through her name and she doesn't even know it because... There's no way I could handle dishes in the in the morning. Uh-huh. <laughs> but <laughs> the, if I continue to listen and learn, I've been so very wrong about myself and about what I needed and what I didn't need that 
listening further and even gently or playfully confronting the other person, maybe even playfully admitting that I may not be the right person for you. Um, it opens up further conversation. I remember when um, I was interviewing Sharon. This is your current wife. So far, yeah, as far as I know, I, I don't think she's wise enough yet. But my my current wife, I, I, I came out of my first marriage just longing for more of a sense of connection. And in my wee little thoughts, I thought, well, we just need to do more together hmm. because we never used to do anything together. So I was thinking, I love backpacking. I think I need to be with a real outdoorsy backpacker. And I brought that up to Sharon. We're talking. And she looked at me with kind of a um, as close to a dead eye as she ever gets. And she sh just gently shook her head. And she said, yeah, that's not me. I would be delighted to wait for you at home with a glass of champagne and a hot bubble bath. So you could sit in there and soak off some of the grime of the trail by telling me all about your trip. And I, th I realized that sounds pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I really don't need a woman to be out backpacking with me. Mm -hmm. I just need a connection. And if and I knew that she was already offering that connection in so many other ways that it no longer mattered whether I did a particular individual thing with her that she really liked uh, or she did a particular individual thing. It was really more of a and my my thinking up to that moment was really more reflective of my uninformed and very low functioning set of skills. Mm. That's good. Well, I like the idea of just yeah, because you're you're not cutting people off right away, and you're listening and you're engaging with them, and you're seeing just you're learning, like you said, learning more about yourself in the process as well, and. I like the name intentional interview too, because I think more and more, I mean, maybe some people still have problems with it, but it seems more and more people are leading with intention or like intention seems like it's conscious and it's awareness. And it's, if you don't have that, like, what do you have, especially when it comes to being in a relationship with somebody? I feel the same way. And, and for me, the discomfort some people feel, I think is reflective of, the discomfort they have when it comes to dating and romance and sex on the one hand and on the other using reason and knowledge to escalate the odds of a successful outcome mm. and so I, because i don't think most people think that way it's almost you know i've been accused even not so long ago of being unfeeling or being um like Mr. Spock on Star Trek and always <laughs> thinking, 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 but I can walk and chew gum at the same time. And I think most people can, I think we can be attracted to somebody and still be intelligent at the same time. It's just, most of us that never gave it a, ch a chance. Yeah. So then what would you say about like putting this into practice? Like if somebody's like, okay, well I've been dating and it's, I've been unsuccessful and I want to take this idea of the intentional interview and put it into practice. Like what are the, I mean, we kind of talked about it, but like what would be the easiest advice to give to somebody? God, I'm thinking, where would I start? It's really, I mean, really there's a lot, a lot to unpack here. I think mm -hmm. one of the most common things I say to men and women is uh, after they tell me their history of failure after failure after yeah. failure uh, in the in the world of romance is um, there's 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 an unfolding pattern. I say, what is it about your pattern that strikes you? What kind of people are you dating? Mm. And then they grimace and they say, well, they're all drunks, or they're all mm. mentally ill, or they're all high drama, or they are all uh, good for nothings. And and I I find myself in agreement with their assessment. And I say, and where do you meet them all? And they usually come up with an answer that's less than satisfying because it's some place where you wouldn't normally think you'd find a lot of compatible people, um, like a bar. Mm -hmm. uh, you would find a lot more alcoholics, I would think, at a bar. You probably would find some religious things in common if you met people at church and meeting people in the uh, traditional old-fashioned way at the grocery store or the laundromat. 
just kind of confirms that you both have eating in common or you both like clean clothes. Yeah. So <laughs> not really. So the asking it's my me, favorite place to meet women. The longer right. <laughs> so where are, where is that target rich environment of potentially compatible people? It's in examining yourself and, and looking within and asking yourself, what is it I like to do? And if I'm the kind of person, and I am, I'm a guy who likes the arts a lot. I like going to art galleries and museums. I like concerts uh, with chamber orchestras, and I love the opera. And all of that is very target-rich for me. Mm -hmm. um, women who are typically dressed to the nines, they're looking amazing. Um, they have a real feel for beauty, and they, and they really appreciate the finer things in life. And I and it and you can do all this for practically free, right? It yeah. doesn't cost a whole lot to do any of these things. And getting to meet these kinds of people for me makes it really easy, whether they're men or women. I find the men easy to talk to because we have something significant in common. I find the women equally easy for the same reason, but um, we're also able then to expand our social network from there in a very I'm going to use the word again, organic mm -hmm. manner, because the people with whom I have a lot in common will inevitably um, invite me over for coffee or invite me over for a barbecue where I'm going to meet other people who they like and mix with. And so I think really the journey toward having a life worth sharing starts with the individual discovering what makes their life worth living. And so each one of us has a slightly different answer for, to that question. For some people, it's all going to be about four wheeling and shooting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I have no idea what kind of women they end up with, <laughs> but they're you know in that circle. There's going to be something that they would all have in common. And I think that to to be going outside of that circle, you could conceivably have a positive outcome. But what I'm talking about is le le leading a life that's really uh, more intentional in the sense that I'm deliberately uh, skewing the odds in my favor so that I have a better chance of a more positive outcome. So for me, it would also include, I like going to school. I like meeting professors and students. I like intellectual conversations. So for me, just signing up for a class virtually any class, mm -hmm. even if I sign up for a pass fail or audit, it's all good. I'm, I, I love hanging out in libraries. Gosh, everybody's going to find out how really boring I am. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that's the kind of bookstores. That's another uh -huh. thing. I mean, I could practically talk to any person in a bookstore and find a lot in common. So for me, all of that world really works, but that isn't for everybody, of course. I mean, for other men I've talked to, it's all about, I mean, they really love fine food and fine dining and mm. travel. And that's, it's not that I hate those things, but they're not really at the top of my list. And for them taking a cooking class mm. uh, and, and for a good looking guy who takes a cooking class, yeah, that's <laughs> I mean, the odds are he's going to meet some amazing women in that group. It's the and, secret, fellas. Take a cooking class. <laughs> well, and the same with taking a dance class. You oh, know, the, yeah. The old line about uh, why would you, a lot of guys uh, worry about taking a, finding a woman to take to, to, a, to a dance class. So they ask their sister or they ask uh, an old girlfriend or a girlfriend they're really not that interested in. Mm. And I'm thinking, and the old line is, why would you take a ham sandwich to a buffet? Yeah. So <laughs> you you just go by yourself. It costs yeah. half as much, uh -huh. and you have a lot more liberty to wander around and and really enjoy yourself. And dancing is one of the very cool social skills that is going to help you for years and years after that class is long over. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter if you're dancing with tall ones or short ones, fat ones or skinny ones, beautiful ones or others not so beautiful. It's it's all good because you're learning the skill and you're talking to people who really want to learn that skill. And inevitably, it results in the group going out dancing, mm -hmm. uh, meeting other people who like dancing, finding out all the venues in town where dancing is available. And it works that way with virtually every subject you and I could think of. Yeah, it's the same with improv. Like yeah. I teach improv comedy. I can't tell you how many romances 
romances have sparked and friendships have developed and all that sort of stuff. And there's, they form a group, they go out. It's the, it's the same thing. Yeah. And, and for some reason, there's a vast uh, swath of the community that forgets this. Mm -hmm. You know, that this is how we used to meet uh, romantic partners back in high school. Mm -hmm. And even for my clients who are really, uh, they're suffering with body dysmorphia. They think they're unattractive. Um, and that's putting it mildly. I have a number of clients, both young and middle-aged and old, who think they're just hideously unattractive. And it's a truth that I usually confirm because I said, I've, I've looked at you before too. It's hard. And <laughs> How does that go? But they usually <laughs> laugh because, um, and then I remind them, actually, women aren't looking for the prettiest guy in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Women in general are looking for a good guy with a good character who um, knows how to make them laugh. And that's they're, they're usually pretty enough for the both of you. So mm -hmm. they don't really need the pretty guy. Yeah. And, and so many guys, you know, in their kind of this cultural moment we're in, they forget what it is to be a man and they think they just are going to be so physically unattractive. No woman would ever want to be with them. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think we all, well, those of us of a certain age can remember Henry Kissinger and who had a head, something like a pineapple. And <laughs> he, he, did, he always did well in romances. And I don't think, you know, I just don't think that for men, the issue is, is looks or youth mm -hmm. or having a svelte figure or big muscles or any of those kinds of things. And I'll just throw this out too. In general, I think there are places to avoid finding a mate mm -hmm. for any of us. And I mean, you might meet one. And I'm this is like a lifelong mate. It's not like people just looking for companionship uh, companion or like sex or something like that. Yeah, it's like well. this is something where you're really trying to build a relationship that's going to last and really try to build something with the yeah. person. I would say in general, there's some major <laughs> faux pas like approaching a hot, sweaty, and I mean hot, not physically attractive, but physically hot. Mm -hmm. Uh, sweaty woman at a gym who's just trying to get her workout in. Mm -hmm. That's distracting and somewhat annoying. And yeah. it really, it's just flat out creepy. And those then Bally's uh, Total Fitness commercials. Do you remember those in the 90s? Yes, it's I like, do. I remember, like, I need to go to a gym. <laughs> it's that. And then, uh, <laughs> gosh, what are some of the others? You know, oh, church, because mm -hmm. I'm so spiritual that all I can think about is dating when I'm at church. Yeah. And that's also, <laughs> I think spirituality in that sense needs to be kept, kept somewhat uh, apart from um, uh, a romantic hunting ground. Mm -hmm. And it's the same because I mean, when, if you're going to be following any religion, you want to have your mind on the thoughts of that religion more mm -hmm. than, Hey, she's really hot. <laughs> uh, um, i'd like to do a survey to see yeah. how many people are actually <laughs> right listening to the gospel or just like oh, yeah she's good or... checking out the talent in the next pew <laughs> yeah i i think you know there's just a number of places like that that are really not conducive to those sorts of conversations in fact they they really i mean i've just i've just talked to so many people who have been put off by that and i think that it's not that it can never happen. And I know this, as this podcast goes out, somebody's going to write and say, well, I met my wife of 50 years ago, you know, mm -hmm. in, in a church or um, at a gym or something. And it's not like it can't happen. I mean, yeah. people can meet in the oddest of places. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've met uh, fun women in a parking lot, you know, going into a store, mm -hmm. start up a conversation. And, and who knows, that could have ended up being a romance uh, for someone. It didn't for me, but I think that it's just it's just to do it all very mindfully. Mm -hmm. I have a, uh, since I've, I'm no longer a believer in religion, I, I have a new trinity, and that is uh, knowledge, reason, and humanity. And if you just bring all those three things into line, it makes it a lot easier to think more clearly. While at the same time, I'm very aroused. I'm a, I'm sexually attracted to her. I find her very intriguing, but I, I still get to think and I get yeah. to think about, you know, how compatible are we really? Mm -hmm. I'm visiting the Mormon church. Is this going to work? <laughs> no, I don't think it is.
so the, a lot of this comes down to like we did an episode three creating a life worth living so it sounds like the first thing to do is start working on that and how these two are ideas the intentional interview creating life worth living they're in, intertwined with each other so once you start doing that and you do start going finding out what you do like and you start attending those places and then so then now it's the conversation like you're going to engage in the conversation with somebody and how to, how is that supposed to like go just so it's like if we meet each other at a dance class like how would you you wouldn't recommend being like oh hey you like dancing let's go you want to go out <laughs> <laughs> you interest you know <laughs> how about we get a room yeah uh no i, like, I it's wouldn't more re- subtle than that right? <laughs> yeah yeah i think you know it's it's uh i've been talking a lot in my office about neediness because i have a lot of male clients who admit that they're really needy and they're really troubled with that. And having a life worth living really takes care of so much of that emotional neediness. Now, the minute I get done, um, I don't think of neediness as a dirty word because the minute I get done eating my last meal, I start decreasing the amount of caloric energy available for my body. The minute I get up in the morning after a great night's sleep, I'm, I'm depleting the energy that was restored during sleep. And I could have had a very good day or even a very good life, a wonderful childhood, great parents, but that doesn't free me from neediness. We all are emotional beings who have emotional needs. The challenge, I think, is looking in the mirror and asking myself, but are my needs, my emotional needs within normal limits? Or have they exceeded those limits and now they're at uh, a pathological state where I can't even relax and have a conversation with someone Mm. because I have such an agenda. Mm. And that agenda really betrays me because I really don't want to get to know her. Mm. I want to possess her. Yeah. Because I must have her. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so lonely. I must have her. And I've been writing a lot of people I know in prison. I do that as a a regular practice. And one of uh, the young men I've been writing in prison. And these are men you've worked with. I I worked with them before they were ever sentenced. Mm. And, you know, they got in trouble with the law, thought they maybe should go to counseling. They did. And then they, for a variety of reasons, reached out. And I encourage that um, because I care about these people. And I really want to see these men restored into a a sense of community or perhaps initiated for the first time into a sense of community. And one young man was writing me uh, just this week and I was writing him this morning. And he said that he he really didn't know if he could ever escape his own neediness. Hmm. And no, it's like I said, we're all going to have needs as long as we're alive. Mm -hmm. Even the most basic physical needs, no matter how successfully I meet them. I mean, they're, they're in flux because I'm alive. I'm a living system, but even, and even wonderfully happily married people have bouts of loneliness or disconnect. So that, you know, it's, it's a fool's errand to try to think I, I, I have to wait until I'm not needy. Mm. But to escape the pathological neediness, I think is largely resolved uh, when I simply develop a life worth living, which yeah. includes not only these act- wonderful activities that really suit me, but all the friends and acquaintances I'm meeting along the way who become significant connections in my life and who really matter to me. Yeah. So then that then when you do, when you have that neediness, figured out and dealt with you could then go into a conversation that's not as direct and not as acquisitive acquisitive yeah, yeah. i'm not i'm not so much interesting in, interested in acquiring her option mm-hmm. but i am i'm really truly interested in getting to know her because you know at the end of any conversation it's a win win because if i find out that she's not for me that's good too and if i find out that she's so intriguing and just as interesting as i thought she was when i asked her out Boy, that's I'm ready for round two. Let's let's go have another coffee or go have lunch again or whatever it is we're gonna do, so that we can have more conversations and really get to know each other. Maybe even, you know, have some fun doing something recreational. But I I wanna I wanna get to know this person because she really interests me. And I think if we 
if we can first take care of our basic needs, then we're free to have those more laid back conversations that aren't so agenda driven mm -hmm. where, you know, really it's kind of ugly to say it, but they're really sort of manipulative because I'm constantly trying to sell the other person uh, yeah. uh, that I'm the right guy. Mm -hmm. When, I mean, that's crazy talk because I don't know if I'm the right guy. I don't even know who she really is. Yeah. So trying to be hip and cool and whatever other adjectives make people uh, <laughs> thrilled nowadays, I think it's really less important than just learning to relax and enjoy the moment and enjoy the mutual reciprocal uh, sharing of ourselves one with another whether it's over a simple cup of coffee or something more elaborate, it doesn't really matter. It could even be just a walk along um, in a park or along the river or something. Yeah. And I think that can be, you know, really enjoyable for people. I, you know, another funny thing about my age is that um, my, my younger clients, they always give me a funny look when I use the word dating. And I'm always open to a better word. And they'll say going out or something like that. I said, yeah, but going out, you guys also use that for meaning you're in a relationship mm -hmm. that's committed. Yeah. And that's, they'll say, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I don't know what the terminology is, but by, by dating, I simply mean an intentional, there's that word again, mm -hmm. an intentional rendezvous with a romantic and or sexual agenda. So asking an, a woman I find attractive out to dinner is really not... Um, just like the same as getting together with a buddy. Mm -hmm. It's really, a, it has a different sort of agenda. And I am interested in getting to know her. Where, whereas when I invite uh, a new man in my life, I find him interesting. I invite him out for lunch. Um, that too is very parallel. It's just there's no romantic or sexual agenda there. Yeah. At least for me. <laughs> so what about, so can you go in? Like, so say you are at, say, a dance class and you see there's a buffet of women there and you, <laughs> and you see one of them and you're like, I'm kind of interested in getting to know her. Um, I am, would want to date her, but I'm not going to like, you, can you have that thought and then go into it? Like, cause I mean, it's like, we're all human. It's like, I don't know if it's ever going to, cause you do make some sort of selection. Maybe. Yeah. I think the, the challenge there is like in, like say I'm going to my first dance class mm -hmm. and in my first dance class, I notice this attractive woman and then she becomes kind of my number one item on my to-do list. And I, I don't really think that's what I have in mind. For me, I went to the dance class to learn to dance. Okay. So I'm focusing in so on you're that. focusing on the activity and then if it does happen and it, you're just... Then it's organic. Mm. And if it... And usually most dance classes are not a one and done. It's... And I'll see you next week, and I'll see you the week after that, and yeah. I'll see you the week. So as the dance classes start stacking up, whether it's only four of them or there's eight, or I'm going for half a year to this, this dance studio to learn how to ballroom dance, whatever it is, I'm going to probably have other opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I really don't need to be desperate in the sense of, yeah, but if I don't ask her now, I mean, she might meet somebody else. And 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 what if she doesn't come back to dance class? And Well, if she doesn't come back to dance class, first of all, she's probably not that into dance or she's got other things going on in her life and she's really not all that available. Mm -hmm. So I can relax because there are about 4 billion women on the planet. Mm -hmm. And if you do the math uh, and you take your age and you add plus or minus whatever number of years you're comfortable with, that reduces the numbers down to like maybe some millions, hundreds of millions. Mm -hmm. But uh, and then you include only the people living in the your part of the world, if if you want to do it that way. And it goes down to only hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. That's still a pretty big number. Yeah. So there's no one woman. I don't I don't believe in the concept of soulmate. Like there's mm -hmm. one person on the planet, if that's what we mean by that concept, who could who really fits me and suits me more than anyone else. I'm a pretty simple guy. And I think I find a lot of human beings very interesting, intriguing and attractive. And if I could have a modicum of, uh, of uh, compatibility, I, I think I'm 
reasonable enough that I could probably make that work with at least thousands of, of women, mm. you know, in the world. And uh, it's really more, though, giving each other a real sense of who we are. That's mm -hmm. what the intentional interview does. So then if you, and it's just, I mean, what kind of questions, you're just asking general questions as far as you're just getting to know someone. So like, just like, what do you like to do for fun? What do you? I would certainly ask that question because yeah. that's important to me. Recreation is mm -hmm. important to me. And it also, what it says about her is important. But, you know, I have one principle that I think is, just right up there at the top of the list for anyone listening to this podcast. And, and I think if they're listening this far, they'll, they'll recognize that what I'm saying is true. Each of us has a past. And in that past, there are some rather unpleasant, even horrible uh, outcomes that we can look back on. Mm -hmm. And like the Buffalo uh, was with the Indians who settled the United States originally, we don't want to waste anything including the knowledge that our painful experiences can reveal to us. So if you've been in a spectacularly and flagrantly flawed relationship, and most people have, to look back at that and learn, okay, what works for me? What doesn't work for me? What am I looking for? That's that existential thing about learning who I am and learning what I'm all about. I can't tell you how many men I you know, even the basics that, well, I grew up in an alcoholic family, as I've shared before in my, in my life, the idea of meeting a woman with a drinking problem was a big turnoff, mm -hmm. but I have met so many guys who didn't grow up in an alcoholic family and they normalized, um, quotes around this word partying. And so for them, <laughs> and so for them, her occasional drunkenness was not a warning sign or mm -hmm. something to look in further. It was something, well, you know, that's okay. We all like to have a good time and I don't want to be controlling after all, but that would be because of my painful experience growing up in my family. Oh, that's going to be an interesting thing. I'm going to want to follow up on. And again, not with the idea that I want to be controlling and certainly not with the idea that as a potential boyfriend, I want to transition and be the therapist because mm -hmm. I can't be both yeah. it's one or the other. But if I, if I want to be, if I'm interested in having a romantic relationship with her and there's a possibility of a drug or alcohol problem, I, I really need to eliminate that problem. And the reason for that is, for those who have already experienced this, they know that as the other person begins drinking or using, um, our significance in their, their lives becomes smaller and mm. smaller and smaller <laughs> as the night goes on. She, she may be flirting with the host <laughs> and the wine steward, even the busboy and the waiter. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm getting smaller and smaller, even invisible by the end of the evening mm. because she's just having her own private world and I get to observe it. And that's all, it, that's all that it is. And there's like maybe uh, 10,000 subjects like that. Yeah. Well, sex, I would say, is another one that you talk about with your, I mean, magic sex number and expressing, having good communication um, or finding somebody who could actually talk about it and all that, right? Right. Absolutely. And, and it's, you know, I'm hoping that those listening to this benefit from the idea that they might learn not just from their own pain, but from the pain of others. Because if you've never been in a profoundly sexually dissatisfying and incompatible relationship, uh, you really might want to think about what that would be like because many people have done that. Mm -hmm. Last This last week, I, I was asking different groups of men, uh, what would it be if we're looking at your pain? What kinds of things would you most not want to repeat? ever again. And I heard so many answers that were really outside of my experience because I've had the good fortune of always being with really responsible, hardworking uh, partners in my life. And um, I had probably 20% of the different groups who said, uh, I just want to be with somebody who has a solid work ethic mm. and who knows how to hold a job. 
And I, I just thought, wow, that is a low bar. But, you know, really, <laughs> it's not. I mean, if if you've been with somebody who couldn't do that, yeah. that's a box you would definitely want to check, right? So there's that. And then, um, gosh, the, the term needy came up. But by neediness, uh, the men I was talking to, they were referring to her at a pathological level of neediness where it became overly controlling and... If you were five minutes late getting home from work, you were obviously cheating on her. So, you know, there'd be the phone calls and the, what yeah. are you doing? Well, how, how come it took you so long? And and all of that. So there was, uh, that was on the list and, and there were a bunch of others. So talking about this stuff with um, other people who are not romantic partners, I think that would be something really illuminating for the average person it is for me at least yeah so in that you call the whole thing about looking back at your past like an intentional debriefing correct yeah yeah for me that it's a you know in the in the military or in the, in in uh, law enforcement they have what they call critical incident debriefings mm -hmm. and where something really seriously bad happened well spinning uh, 20 years of your life with the wrong person and going through an expensive and painful divorce, that's a critical incident. I think that's yeah. something nobody would ever want to repeat, not even a five-year marriage or a, you know even a three-year marriage. We, we would all of us like to skip that part if we can. I have a quick question on that. Sure. So sometimes people are in a marriage and then one person learns the thing and then the other person just doesn't learn anything. Like, what is, what is that about? <laughs> <laughs> well, you mean where somebody is growing spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, that kind of thing? Yeah. Like I know someone who was in a marriage for however many years, has two kids, and then broke up about a year ago. He, he's now just remarried and, you know, she's not married, but it's like, but learning less, it's like, there's some, like, some people learn the lesson, some don't, it seems like. Or the pain wasn't enough for them to learn the lesson or like oh, what. Yeah. yeah. I, there's a great saying that I heard originally in um, a 12-step meeting. I've attended hundreds of 12-step meetings in my life. Um, and I think for me, uh, the phrase, nobody changes until the pain gets bad enough. Mm. And we usually refer to that as hitting bottom. And, but the, the, some people have a very high pain threshold, right? Okay. And they can take, I mean, you talk to somebody who's married 11 alcoholics in a row and you wonder, okay, so wow, that's really in a, in a really cynical way. It's kind of impressive because <laughs> I, I don't think I could do that. I just don't think I have it in me to be able to do that. And, and it is true that people can grow apart. And, and that's why I, I really do try to encourage people to, I know he's hopeless. Whenever I bring up Benjamin Franklin, I invariably think of the Quaker Oats guy <laughs> because they all seem to be dressed the same back mm -hmm. then. That and, was the look. And yeah, the look. <laughs> it was a hot look back then in the 1700s. And they, uh, but Benjamin Franklin really got around. He was quite the ladies' man. And one of his old sayings that I think applies so much in romance is, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, mm -hmm. which is why taking the time to really get to know someone I think is so important. And your friend, I wish him the very best of luck. But after getting a divorce, I think it takes at least at a minimum of a year to even begin the intentional debriefing mm -hmm. that, that you need to really learn what was your part in all of that. It takes a year just to even get to that point? Yes, I think because you... You have to, there's so many truths that are very unpleasant. You have to kind of gird up your loins like a man <laughs> and, and look in the mirror and say, wow, now why did I pick them? Hmm. And what is it about me? I mean, as flawed as I think they are today, well, what was it about me that would pick them? And often it's not very pretty. Hmm. And then why did I choose to stay with them? Again, that's not a very pretty truth Yeah. Um, because it usually has something to do with neediness of my own or codependency, hmm. fear of being alone. And, and just because I got a divorce, 
that doesn't mean all that shit disappeared. Yeah. It's all still in there like some kind of creepy virus like chickenpox or something <laughs> waiting to come out in the form of shingles. Yeah. And I, I just, I think really um, every one of us who's ever been in a significant relationship and then breaks up, whether it was marriage legally or not, I think taking the time to date a lot and by a lot, I don't, I'm going to share a number with everybody that I think would be ideal, but I, th I think aiming for about 30 different people to date would really protect everyone from the uh, rebound relationship mm. uh, because you are gonna, you're going to catch yourself falling in love. But if you can stick to this number 30 or, or close to it, you're going to find yourself um, doing a lot of dates that don't get past a first date because she just wasn't the right person for you. And there are a lot of dates that or relationships, if we can call them that, that'll last less than a month. So conceivably in a year, I might, I might date 10 different women easily, yeah. very easily, but uh, it's going to take some years to, if you're intelligent at all, it's going to take some years to date 30. And I'm not, I'm not including the guy or the woman who likes to just go out and pick up somebody. Mm -hmm. Because if that's your thing, and I do have clients like that who make no bones about it. They've been in prison for 20 years. They have no intention of, of getting with anybody mm -hmm. in a committed relationship. They just want to make sure every woman in town has safely escaped her virginity. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so they're like racking up some really big yeah. numbers. And you know, I have no problem with that if it's all consensual, mm -hmm. um, legal. I, I that's that's an adult decision everybody gets to yeah. make for themselves. But if you're looking for a little more than that, and mm -hmm. I, even as a a boy, as a teenager, I was always looking for more than that because I wanted mm -hmm. something more significant. Yeah, you know, it was for me that kind of sexual relationship is a little too much like masturbating with somebody watching, and because she's not really yeah. significantly a part of my life it's just a kind of a creepy voyeur <laughs> is that something that they is that some people do they just have that as like this is just me this is what i do or and that's just their preference or or are they like blocked in some way where they don't want to i've met both mm -hmm. i've met i've met people who for whom it was just simply a, a season of their lives they just wanted to do this for a time mm -hmm. and they weren't meeting anybody who was putting an amazing offer that on the table, yeah, at least not they? one they could recognize. Okay. And a couple of times these guys would fall. I've, I've talked to these guys and whoa, they find themselves falling in love and someone is really amazing. And then within that first three months of the relationship, they realize, Ooh, not for me. And mm -hmm. they back away and, you know, and, and she goes on happily with somebody else, but there are those people and there's always somebody angry at me for saying this, but there's a significant portion of the population that is, to all outer appearances, human, but really are more human-shaped objects than they are human beings mm. in that they're not capable of the highest function of humanity, and that is to love. Love is the the glue, the cohesion that that binds us together and that helps us to to care for each other and to behave in caring loving, empathic ways. And so some, it's not just narcissists. Um, and by narcissists, I don't mean men who are having a hard time listening to anybody but the wonderful sound of their own voice. I mean people who are actually impaired and di diagnosable as having narcissism. I also would include women who have that problem or women who have other problems. Uh, somebody with an ongoing drug or alcohol problem. They are not available. Mm -hmm. They may they can fall in love to a degree, yeah, but they're not capable of participating in an ongoing loving relationship. What about two people who just like to drink and party, like in air quotes, <laughs> <She's> like, <laughs> and they're like, "That's what we. That's their activity that they do together." Yeah, and I that. I know a lot of couples like that mm -hmm. who you know are in and out of my office, and. The drama they create with their drug use more than eclipses any emotional pleasures they're getting. 
Okay. So it's it's very painful and it's sort of like this is going to be very vulgar. So if you're traveling in the car with small children, you might want to make them put their fingers in their ears. <laughs> but you know, the get that old saying about the fucking I'm get, getting is not worth the fucking I'm getting. <laughs> <laughs> Because there's so much drama. Yeah. And it's just so, um, like every week there's a new issue and it's just mm. so upsetting. And yeah. for some people, a, a significant, it's not a small portion of the community, it's a significant portion of the community and they really get around. So most of us have met those people. Love isn't really about love, it's really about passion. Mm -hmm. And passion can include any of the animal passions. Lust, yeah, but also anger, resentment, jealousy, any of those represent for them love. And so it feels like they really care and they really love because they're stalking you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and But that kind of drama can get some of us killed and it does. And I think mm -hmm. that kind of uh, relationship is very unpleasant. However, there are those people who don't know any better and for them well that's what it is to be in a loving relationship yeah i've talked to many women i'm sorry to say who think um men like that that's that's the way men are and that's the the ticket price hmm. you know for admission to the world of romance or the world of a regular sex life is that you have to put up with abuse and that sort hmm. of thing and i've also talked to men who didn't have the language to express it because men typically don't think of themselves as victims in that way. But once they, they learned the words, they were able to say almost exactly the same thing about some of their experiences mm -hmm. where they felt hurt, taken advantage of, belittled, uh, put down, um, betrayed. And they're finally able to say, yeah, that isn't love. I, that's what I thought was love. I thought that was romance, but it, now that you ask me, no, that's not what I want at all. Yeah, you know, I want something that's calm. I want, I don't want it to be so calm we're always falling asleep by eight thirty. Mm -hmm. But I want it to be free of drama. That, and by yeah. drama, of course, I mean the needless escalation of a problem. Mm -hmm. We have enough problems in real life to without adding to those problems. Yeah, you know, like the partner who gambles away your rent money. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard enough to earn the money and to put up with a job that I'm not crazy about and then to find that it's all gone. You know, it's down at a casino somewhere. <laughs> That's very upsetting. Yeah. You know, for the person who earned that money. Yeah. But she was great in the, she was great in bed though. <laughs> <laughs> right. I hear a lot of no. that. <laughs> I hear a lot of that where it's, you know, because again, they're, what resonates in their brain is the passion. Yeah. Not love. Mm -hmm. So I guess that would be something, you know, in an intentional interview. For me, I would always want to know, is this yeah. person cap even capable of love? And I, I'll throw something, another hint or clue out to people. You know, it's we're not to avoid those people who fall in love easily. So I can't tell you how many women I dated during my single years who would say things like, and you probably heard this too, um, oh, I've never loved anyone the way I love you. I've never heard that. <laughs> oh, shut up. I can't believe it. I, I've, I've never felt this way about any man the way I feel about you. I've never, And I've never loved like this. I've never had a relationship like this, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if that were true, that would be a very ominous sign because it would mean she's never really fallen in love. Mm. and the the reality is the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior still uh, and it's been like a hundred years since that observation was made originally and so we you know if you if you had a crush on your fourth grade teacher that was probably all you as a fourth grader could summon mm -hmm. to the world of love and romance and if you had a girlfriend in sixth grade and you had your first kiss um that that too was love. Mm -hmm. And if you keep moving on from there, uh, and you, and as you look back in time, you realize, Oh, I've fallen in love a lot. Yeah. And that's, that's such a reassuring and sign. And that's healthy. Oh yeah. yeah. It's so reassuring Yeah, because it means you have the, these feelings, uh, in you to give mm -hmm. and to experience. 
The challenge is how do I bring my brain along in the same bucket with my heart mm -hmm. so that I just, I, I'm not just wearing my heart on my sleeve and getting hurt and yeah. hurt and hurt. I still remember enough of the Bible to quote a passage from Psalms where it says, guard above all things, the wealth springs of your heart for from it flow the waters of life. I think we're supposed to be a little more careful about who we get in love with or not, we can't control who we fall for mm -hmm. because there's no controlling the human heart, but we can control who we commit to. Mm -hmm. We can control who we have sex with. We can, tr we can control a lot of the different aspects of a romance, including am I going to meet her at the restaurant or do I dare pick her up? Because if I pick her up, then I'm going to have to drop her off and then she might invite me in for coffee. Do I really want to, do I want to have sex with her? Because if I go in for some coffee, my pants are going to fall off. Yeah. <laughs> so I would like to, I, I, I and I'm, again, I'm not against uh -huh. sex. It's just to be mindful and proactive about planning out mm -hmm. how far do I really want to go? Because sometimes when people have sex, people end up pregnant. Yeah. And then you have a wonderful 18 year commitment. Mm hmm you know, for another human being, even if you don't get married. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's a very big deal. Yeah. So rack kind of wrapping all this up then. So the goal with the intentional interview is lasting love. You're going for something that you're really getting though. I mean, to me, a lot of your relationship technology is like, Hey, do you want to have like an epic romance, you put it a lot of times. Do you, if you really want to have that, where there's no abuse, where you're connected, your the intimacy is building, exp like just nonstop, it just goes and goes and goes. If you want to really grow with a person and evolve, this is what this is for. And I feel like this is if this is what you're looking for, this is when you apply the intentional interview. Absolutely, and I suppose the big claim there is through interviewing, I find out if we're really compatible, but I can't do that. I won't be able to accept the feedback of compatibility versus no, she's really not compatible. If I don't have a life worth living. Yeah. Gotta do that first. And then you do the intentional debriefing as well. Yeah. Following a failed romance. Yeah. You know, like which everyone was was going to have, I think, to get to this level. Like a sixteen year old, I don't think is going to pick up this. Well, this again, you know, I mean, I've had those people who correct me, and they'll say, "Well, I met my sweetheart, you know, eighty years ago in high school, and it's been a great hundred years together." So, yeah. you know, whatever it is that, um, whatever it is, uh, most of us are going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. There are those golfers who hit a hole in one, yeah. <laughs> but it's kind of rare when you consider all the numbers of golfers and all the golf balls that go up in the air. Mm -hmm. Very few people do that. What I am trying to get across with the intentional interview is that there's an actual science to it, a science to increasing the probability of a happy outcome, as opposed to the guy who's just saying, well, I just believe in being spontaneous and I don't have time for all that. And I just let my heart guide me. Mm -hmm. and for most of us, that isn't working out so well. Yeah. I agree with that. And, <laughs> <laughs> from yeah. three failed relationships. Well, only three? I mean, I, I think I've well, got Well, long term. I mean, they were all like two or five years about and then one was three so they were they kind of felt like little mini marriages they were yeah they they really were mini marriages that's a long time yeah and now i've woken up <laughs> started working for you and started applying these <laughs> concepts have been have felt the pain of rock bottom well and you know, ready to <laughs> change another thing i think would that would help you or anybody else listening to this would be um the idea, there are a lot of men and women out there who think if you went on one date, you're somehow being immoral. If you go on a second date or another date with somebody else before clearing it with them. Mm, yeah. And my thought is, no, just because I took her out for coffee or even dinner, it doesn't mean that now I have to clear it with her or anybody yeah. else before I can date. So conceivably, somebody like you, instead of staying staying stuck with someone for a number of months or even longer mm -hmm. as long as there's no lying and no commitment you've got your honor intact yeah. 
um, you don't, it's not like you need to clear the air too and say, well, you know, I, I am dating other people. It's yeah, you're an adult. You get to date other people. You yeah. have the right to do that. So does she. And commitment is so important to me that I don't presume there's one unless it's been discussed thoroughly. Yeah. And so many people just don't do that. They get really weird, especially following intercourse. If they make it, if two adults make a decision to have intercourse, mm -hmm. that's all that was. Two adults made a decision to have intercourse. That yeah. was not a down payment on a commitment. Yes, totally. And I have been living that way now, like after the last relationship. And that's been kind of the way it's been going. Right. I mean, it truly, if you respect mm -hmm. women, I think as a man, it would mean, um, turning your back on sexism and understanding, yeah, she's an adult. If she has a need, she can express that with words. Mm -hmm. And and she can say, well, I'd really rather not sleep with you if you're, I'm not in a committed relationship. Okay, because yeah. you know I enjoy dating you and just talking to you. We don't have to sleep together. Mm -hmm. I have scads of other candidates for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that's a great way to end. <laughs> All right. End it there. Well, thanks, Steve. It was, that was great. I really appreciated hearing all that. And thank you. You're very welcome. I hope other people had as much fun as we did. Yeah. All right. See y'all later.